it's all torn apart. I'm enclosing the wood shop for, for some stuff that you're gonna see here in a month or two. But right now I'm waiting for John Brand, who's driving down from Eugene. He lives up north. He's one of the six guys that I played with as a kid in the jazz minors. We played traditional Dixieland jazz. Dixieland, more than traditional. And he's local and we're great friends and we've known each other for, you know, almost 50 years. And I'm buying his old tuba because I've been learning to play the upright bass and I play the trombone and I thought, you know, I've got grandkids and they're musicians and maybe they would like to play the tuba because I've always wanted to and maybe we can spread that around. And then my next thought was, John just got a brand new beautiful tuba and I'm gonna see if I can buy his old. And so I called him yesterday and he's bringing it down today. And I've wanted one for a long time and today's the day and I get to see John. And so, once again, I'm pausing for just a second to count my blessings. Good to see you, my friend. All right, so explain to me. So John has never had a lesson on the tuba. We just, the jazz minors, we were teenagers. We formed and Rusty Steyer's heard he played string bass. Boy, did he play string bass. And he brought it over, and after a while, Rusty said, we need a tuba player. Here's a sousaphone. That's about how it went, right? Pretty close. <laughs> I might have gotten I might have gotten one time when a tuba player maybe showed me some stuff. Right. I right. sat down and, okay, do this, and I bought a, you know, a beginning book, you know, sure, okay. da, 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 da. And then we told the story on the podcast about the ski mask jammed up inside the sousaphone preventing it from yeah playing. He, he couldn't really make it go and he, oh, he attributed it just being a beginner oh yeah i mean he fished out that a, a repairman pulled it out and it was that thing just oh it was wonderful boom boom yeah all that matters is what's coming out of the horn yeah, yeah, however you get there whatever it is what's coming out of the horn and the beauty of dixieland jazz is the second thing that matters is whether or not what's coming out of the horn is cooperating and staying in its lane with the other instruments that are all improvising at the same time. It's a magic thing. Yeah. So I'm going to bring Kelly out here. Okay. And we're going to play it too. Oh, good. excellent. Right. Excellent. Right. So here we are. We have a uh, Dixieland Jazz Trio, sort of, but actually no sort of. This is this is kind of a classic trio yeah. Yeah. instrumentation. Yeah. Difference is John's played. Oh, I don't know, maybe <laughs> 40 times as much as I have. But that's all right. We had a lot of good times playing, and Kelly has made it possible for she and I to continue to progress here at home over the last 50 years. Turned years. herself into quite a nice banjo yeah. player. Hasn't she, though? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's really, that's impressive. So her dad bought that banjo for her in our first year of marriage. Yes. Oh 1979 or 80, 1980-ish. Yeah. yeah. And she's just been, John, she picked up old-time fiddle. I know. Right? That I know from yeah. Facebook. And yes. now she picked up mandolin. And she had this and the piano, and it's all just coming up at once. She's doing so good. That's a rule of music, by the way. Any progress you make on any instrument is going to reflect in the other instruments and musical outlets that you have. Yep. All right, let's play Sweet Georgia Brown okay. in the key of A flat. Ooh, okay. Starts on an F7. F7, correct. Kind of me. One, two. <laughs> We're forgetting, we played 
at the Hatfield Dowland U of O football yes, that was complex so together fun. when mm -hmm. Coach Taggart had that. He had all the coaches there. That's we right. We played together. I got a picture. Meg was there. Yes, mm -hmm. I got a picture standing next to Marcus Mariota's Heisman Trophy. <laughs> <laughs> that was so fun. That was, was a fun. blast. Yeah. yeah, it. I don't know how I find myself occasionally playing lead in a Dixieland combo when I am made and programmed and trained to play a sideman. Well, and that's that was that's what's so cool because it's like that's not what you grew up doing. You had your spot, your lane, and you did it fabulously. And now we're throwing you into the deep end of the pool going, oh, man. Yeah, you, you did take the head. You're fine. We're, we're going to do what we've always done. Take the floaties off, son. You'll be fine. All right. Now, while we are doing this, so there's one other thing to talk about here, and that is that John's written a book. How many people do that? Not many. Uh, well, okay. more than you think. <laughs> and it's called Over Loud, Over Fast, and Overrated. And it's the memoirs, it's the, it's the account of the tour that the Jazz Miners did in 1977. Seven. Summer of 77. That's right. John yeah. kept a journal. I, I, which is so not like me. Yeah. I, I, I just, I found it. And it was, wow, I kept a pretty detailed account of what happened. Last Halloween, actually, I, I was all done. And it was all, I had it uploaded on Kindle Create, and I pressed the button and went, publish. And I thought, what the heck? And at that point in time, it was just an ebook. What is this? So I sent out a Facebook post saying, hey, this is available. And people started buying it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so the title. <laughs> like we mentioned on that, on that, uh, so we played this jazz band that he and I played in. We were all teenagers. You yeah. were the oldest. I, I was. Brad was the youngest. Probably at this point in time on the tour, I think it was probably Brad was 16 and I was 20. So yeah. and everybody else was in between. Yeah. Yeah. So and Kelly and I were an item even then, <laughs> and uh, we played 69. 70, 69 jobs in 75 days across the country. In fact, something like that. Day. You, you'll have to. The numbers are correct in there, and I don't remember, but that's close. Okay, and we played, it was at the Big Spiderbeck Memorial Jazz Festival that the reviewer, what was his name? No idea. Okay. <laughs> no idea. He panned us, rightfully so. He said we were over loud, over fast, and overrated, and brother, did he get that right. <laughs> now, at the time, we didn't think that. Yeah. That yeah. was not what we thought. We thought some choice other things, yeah, but, <laughs> but in hindsight, hindsight yeah, he was, he was right on the money. So it, it became the obvious title oh, for the yeah. book. All right, we've got to play one more okay. tune. Okay. What Let's should it be? be? Well, it's, it's whatever you know the head to. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Let's play Back Home Again in Indiana. Perfect. Because it was Indiana. Did we, did we play in Indiana? We did. Yes, yes, we did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, we drove on the Indianapolis 500 Speedway. Yes, we did. Oh, okay. That was one of the things That's that they right. let us do. It was yeah. a Buick. 88 or oh, something. Jeez, year of memory is so good. <laughs> One, or two. Because um, I guess if there is a message that's associated with this channel besides work hard and do good work, 
It's value the people that yeah. are in your circle, that that God brings into contact with you and your life, Every and uh, don't throw those relationships away under any circumstance. Yep. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman. <laughs> <laughs> and keep up the good work. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.